my own experience. I'm going to start with um, my own. How do I get rid of this? Do, 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 do. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of an autobiography of my own fascination with maps, because um, it's been there from the beginning. And um, a certain kid, you'll find this in a certain subset of kids. Some kids are intrinsically fascinated with maps, and it's really good to facilitate their fascination. All kids are interested in maps. So using two-dimensional or three-dimensional representations of the world to, uh, to have them show what they know is really valuable. Uh, my first mapping memories was my Skaney Addles, or I think it's now Brio wooden toy trains. Um, and those are the little toy, tra toy wooden tracks that you fit together and there's little uh, cars you can run around them. I loved them when I was about four or five. And when I go into a classroom where they're there, I kind of stop doing the thing I'm supposed to doing and play with the toy trains. Um, and then when my father, uh, when I was about six, my father read my father's dragon, my father's dragon to me. And it was the first book that had a map on the end paper. Um, and it meant to me that this must be a real story if there was actually a map. Um, and I've done lots of stuff with this book with kids. Uh, when I was a little bit older, I really got into uh, uh, electric trains, Lionel trains, and H&O trains. And I loved being able to lie down on my belly and look at the world that I had created and feel like it was a real world. Uh, when I was about eight or nine, I would uh, make tennis ball runs on the beach. I could would set myself challenges about how many, about having arcs and tunnels and banked curves and um, and so I wanted to create a miniature landscape that was kind of like a three-dimensional map. Uh, by the time I was nine, I could put together the United States of America puzzle faster than anybody else uh, in my family and probably in my class. And I was, really, I was really invested in learning all the capitals of the states and the provinces. <clears throat> Around 11 or 12, I started to go on these um, exploratory uh, adventures with a, a neighbor friend of mine. So I lived in one of these houses that's in the lower left-hand corner. And then we were going exploring back into this kind of abandoned farm wilderness that was up there on the right-hand side. And part of what was interesting about this is that Kevin and I would go out on, on an adventure uh, there was always the danger of farmers with shotguns and and uh, uh, you know salt rock salt in their barrels. Um, we'd go out do an adventure. We'd come back and we would make a map of where we had been. So part of the excitement was exploring the landscape and making a map of it. When I was about thirteen or fourteen, I got really interested in. Uh, uh, writing away to all the state tourism bureaus that were advertised in National Geographic and having them send me the state tourism uh, map packet. And so I collected a map from all the individual states. And then when I was a little bit older, my mother wallpapered my bedroom, uh, what a thoughtful mother she was, uh, with a world map that was eight feet by 12 feet. And then I would play all kinds of games with it. So it's interesting to see the transformation from miniature, small miniature worlds that were three-dimensional to uh, increasingly larger worlds and representations that were two-dimensional. And that's what I'm gonna try and illustrate when I uh, show you the rest of my slides. And so that's that. this is what led me to my fascination with my own map making experience and then map making with children. So I'm gonna show you some research that I did. Uh, this will mostly be from uh, uh, in uh, the county of Devon in England. And uh, <clears throat> I worked in a couple of different primary schools and I'm just gonna show you maps from one primary school. And I asked children five to 11 years old to draw me a map of their neighborhood. Um, and when kids said, well, what's a map? 
I would say, well, it's a picture of how things are arranged around where you live. So the prompt was the same for all the children. Uh, and then uh, I went on field trips with some of the children to go explore these places, but I'm mostly just going to show you their maps. So this is uh, this first little girl. Here's a pic. Oh, that's the wrong. Oh, yeah. OK. I understand. Here. OK. This first little girl. Now, here's a picture of um, this cul-de-sac where these couple of kids lived. And this is the outside in view of this little patch of bushes that's in the center of this cul-de-sac. And this is the inside out view of kids view of that same patch of bushes. So the premise here is that we often design curriculum from the outside in, from the adult perspective down to the child. And what we need to be doing uh, if we want to develop good developmentally appropriate education as well as good sense of place education is develop curriculum from the child's eye view upwards towards the adult view or the knowledge view of the world. So we want to start where the kids are at and move outwards rather than start where we're at and move downwards or inwards. So here's this girl's uh, standing in front of her home. And you'll see it's the driveway, the girl, her house, and then a hedge over on the right-hand side. And here's her map of <clears throat> her world, of her neighborhood at this point. There's a the little girl, the house, the driveway, and then over here, the hedge, right? So it's actually fairly representational, accurately representational. It's a flat image. It's as if she's uh, uh, showing us a picture rather than a map. And what, I'm, what we're going to do is see the, the gradual evolution of the map concept in two dimensions. Uh, one dimension is going to be the increasing scope of the child's world. And the other dimension is going to be the perspective that the child uh, looks at the world from. So another five-year-old map. Uh, lots of British kids' maps include rainbows. Uh, but again, mostly just the house and the garden. Uh, by six, kids start to move outwards and represent not just their own house, but neighbors' houses. Um, and they're also, in these six-year-old maps, there's often uh, uh, people, you know, kids are illustrated, whereas they're gonna disappear later on. This is the beginning of a change in perspective. So you've got essentially got two baselines in this map, the house and that funny looking gate sit on one baseline. And then there's a yellow line where the apple trees sit. So there's a foreground and a background. So it's as if the perspective of the child has risen a little bit and, and the map is starting to stretch out in space. This, this map has three baselines. There's the foreground where the yellow house is, the midground, two houses, and then one in the back. So the perspective of the child is rising up slightly and the scope of the map is getting bigger. Same thing, foreground, midground, background, big, slightly bigger scope. <clears throat> By nine years old, the perspective has risen almost up to a 45 degree angle. So it's as if this child is on top of a church spire looking at their neighborhood. Uh, and this is a particularly interesting map. I wanna just make sure what my next map is. Okay, good. So these two maps are the two, this map and the next one are by two children that live in this line of houses that are at the top. One was a, uh, uh, Afro-Caribbean Jamaican girl and the other was a Caucasian boy. They lived right near each other. They weren't friends, but both of their maps focus on this world of trees that was like a little ratty thicket on the other side of their road. And this child's map says tree house, tree house, look out tree, my secret den, look out tree, tree house. So one of the interesting things that's happened is that the, the focus of the map has moved from the child's own home to the explorable landscape. 
So this little ratty thicket is the explorable landscape. Interesting that this other child's map, I think this is the uh, Afro-Caribbean girl, uh, they weren't friends, they were the same age, they have the same relationship to this patch of woods that was out in front of their, across the street from their houses. And so she says, my den, my den and my friend's den. Um, so the explorable world is what nine-year-olds want to, that's what they're becoming interested in. <clears throat> Some kids can't do, can't draw perspective well. So at nine years old, they combine a kind of aerial view and a pictorial view. So this is actually an accurate view of roads, but she's folded down the fronts of the houses. And then she's got, she's illustrated the trees as if pictorially rather than from above. Here's a perfect, uh, <clears throat> here's a perfect panoramic view or a, or a 45 degree angle view. And this is, a child who lived in the same neighborhood as that first little girl. So think of the first little girl. She lived in this house down here in the corner named where it says Victoria's house. Um, and she just illustrated uh, her pictorial view of her house. The nine-year-old is illustrating the whole neighborhood and a little bit beyond the neighborhood. And she's up elevated up high. So what you've got here is you've, hold, you've held everything constant except for the age of the child, right? So that there's this interesting evolution from five years old up to nine or 10. Now, by, then by 10 or 11, you've moved, you continue the movement upwards in, ter in terms of perspective. So you're starting to get an, uh, not quite a, an uh, aerial view, but you're at a high angle view. Um, and again, the roads here are accurate. The houses are still folded down. And the scope of the map is much bigger than at nine. So this is multiple neighborhoods rather than one neighborhood. A little bit older. The, uh, the arrangement of the houses, of the arrangement of the roads and the placement of the trees are even more accurate here. The house faces are still folded down. And notice that this, the significance of the child's own home has really diminished, hardly plays a role in the map at all. And then by 13, you get this. It actually looks like a map. Uh, the houses have disappeared. The person, the home house of the child has disappeared. The scope has really increased significantly and it's a pure aerial view. And when I was doing research with these kids, there wasn't, it was, uh, there were so many new developments in this uh, area that uh, there wasn't a good map. So I would use this kid's map to, nav to navigate around in the different, to the different places in this neighborhood. The other really interesting thing <clears throat> is that in terms of when you ask kids about special places from five or six up to a 10 or 11, they'll talk about their den in the hedge or their den in the forest. This child said, if you had asked me a year or so ago, I would have told you about my den down here in the woods along the stream. But now my favorite place is, are the shops in Newton Abbott. Newton Abbott's the kind of market town for this area in Devon. And so he was moving from what Joseph Pierce calls the earth matrix, bonding with the earth, you know, making a den, having it be your own, being away from your parents to the social matrix of being in town and hanging out with friends in the mall, that kind of thing. Okay, so what should, if this, is a, if this is a developmental truism, in other words, if this, what I just showed you is, is biologically somewhat predetermined in children, um, uh, then how do you construct good 
geography or social studies or good sense of place education in alignment with this, with this uh, progression. The progression from close to home or close to school to out to the village to out into the world. And from, uh, from a three-dimensional looking at it uh, from face on to more two-dimensional and aerial views, the more pure map view. So this is a school in, uh, in South Brent in Devon, uh, 35 kids in a tiny little classroom. Uh, and this teacher is having the children make a model of from the school to the post office. The post office is about a quarter of a mile away. So this involves lots of field walking field trips from the school to the post office to figure out what's there and then figure out how to represent it. And so for young kids, three-dimensional models are more effective tools for helping children to demonstrate their understanding than two-dimensional mapping. So these kids are having to make decisions about, okay, how are we gonna, how are we gonna uh, uh, make small representations of the houses and the post office and buildings along the way? And they you know, pushed a whole bunch of tables together so they could make this big model. Uh, and this is what it looked like towards the end. Um, the school is up at the top of the picture. Uh, there's a basketball court up there and a bunch of portable classrooms. And the post office is down here at the bottom of the picture. And there were, uh, this required uh, kids, you know, they would say, I can't remember what color the roof is on the house that I'm making a model of. And the teacher would say, well, you have to go with a, a uh, another teacher or a parent and you have to go down there and figure it out. And then right here in the center where you see all these sticks, that was scaffolding on a building that was being renovated. So a really accurate representation that makes kids look at and talk about and, uh, and describe in good language terms. Um, and kids love doing this. This is a nice example of a little piece of the map. This was a goldfish pond that was located on <clears throat> a school property. And so the goldfish pond is illustrated with clay and aluminum foil and saran wrap. And the goldfish are little popcorn kernels. Here's this, an, uh, a project in a different school. And this was um, part of the parish maps project in England where villages were uh, compelled to make parishes of make maps of their own parishes. And this school project related to it was this landscape uh, artist who came to work with the kids to make uh, a map of this area that started at where they were standing, which was a crossroads for five lanes. And they were gonna make a map of about a 10th of a mile radiating out in all directions from this one crossroads. So we're going from where I'm taking the picture out to that big, whatever it is, might be a maple tree in the distance. On this section of road, what they were gonna do is make a sound map. So he said, you can't talk at all. And all I want you to do is pay attention to the sounds that you hear and um, write down the sounds in the order that you hear them. So here's one girl's notes, bees buzzing, wind blowing, airplane trobbing, cows mooing, talking, arguing, sore throats very loud, water rippling very gently, very gently whispering, telling secrets. This is raw material for the map that's gonna get made. On the way back, he said, okay, now on the way back, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna collect colors and stuff from the landscape to represent this place on the map. So if we're gonna, if this is a muddy lane, we're gonna collect mud to bring it back and we're gonna paint the mud onto the map to represent the place. He really wanted to make this kind of close connection between the place and the representation of the place. And then he showed them how you could take uh, parts of plants and rub them and get their pigment from them. So the yellow alien on the green plant, that's a dandelion rubbing on the page. 
uh, there was a green button. They also collected cabbage leaves from a field that was uh, planted in cabbage. And uh, you could get the faint green uh, pigment off of the cabbage leaves. <clears throat> Here they are making the map in the classroom. There was a quarry, that's that spiral, and part of this in part of this area. <clears throat> and there was a public footpath. So to represent the public footpath, you take mud from the public footpath, you get a child to put her foot in the uh, mud and then print her footprint on the map to illustrate the public footpath. And then that, that's the map close to being done. Here's the, you can see the footprints over here, that's the map. Uh, right here along this was the sound poem. So extracts from all the different kids uh, sound uh, sensations were in order on along, oops, were in order along that uh, section of uh, road. And here were the, the cows who were arguing and mooing very loud with sore throats. And here you can see a little map of Australia, the outline of Australia, because there was a woodworker who uh, used wood that came from Australia in the products that he was making. So uh, again, connecting kids deeply to their local place through a kind of, of sensory involvement and then mapping their sensory involvement. Same kind of idea in Springfield, Vermont. This is an old industrial uh, uh, small city in Vermont. And the fourth grade teacher is going to make a model from the from the waterfall that you can see in the middle of the uh, image up underneath this bridge. You can barely see. Oops. Disconnect that. Up underneath that bridge, and then up to another waterfall that's up above the um, where you can't see. And this is a tax map of the area. So where the uh, post-it note is where the classroom is. So easily walkable down to the center of the village. That first dam that we saw below is at the bottom. The bridge is in the middle. The upper dam is at the top. And this is as part of a, a, a unit on uh, the, the geography of Vermont. And he focused on the, uh, the um, watershed of the river that flowed through the center of the city, which had been a, a industrial village because of all the water power. This is the teacher at uh, the upper part of their map. So it's a very dramatic, rocky, uh, rapidy part of a uh, uh, section of river. <clears throat> they did a lot of exploring of nooks and crannies and uh, this was an alleyway and uh, the literature that they used for this study was a, a biography of a boy who grew up in the city in 1910. And so they read about his experiences in the city uh, at you know about a hundred years ago. And he would walk down this alleyway and then walk across a little rickety footbridge to get to the school on the other side. The kids came back from lunch one day and the teacher handed them pictures of the buildings on both sides of the river. And he had put two doors on frames in the center of the classroom. He said, okay, so the doors are the river. Uh, now I want you to line yourselves up along the river uh, in the right order of the buildings. And the kids knew that, that area well enough by this point so that they could do that. And then the two girls, in the middle of the image said, you don't have a picture of the bridge will be the bridge. So they're holding hands across the, uh, the river. And then he said, okay, now it's your responsibility with your picture to make, a, to make that building because we're gonna rebuild downtown Springfield in the classroom. So two by sixes braced so they could be the banks of the river. The girls that said, will be the bridge, they had to build the bridge. 
And since it was a concrete bridge, they had to make build a form for the bridge, obviously with a lot of help from the teacher. And uh, so there's the form for the bridge. And then they're putting in wire, which is essentially to represent rebar that goes inside when you make a, when you pour a bridge. And since it's a concrete, a poured concrete bridge, you have to mix up the concrete and pour it to make the bridge. And so this is the source of my favorite um, educational metaphor. Uh, you know, how we were always saying, we, we we're always trying to make education more concrete, and this is really it. Concrete's an interesting ma uh, material to use in the classroom that is way underutilized. There's the kids uh, making them uh, their model of their building, uh, and there was all kinds of interesting uh, discussions about scale and uh, how you get all the buildings to be in scale with each other which the teacher did in a very nice uh, qualitative way. The, uh, they paper mache the banks of the river and they went out and collected slate because um, the cuts through a slate belt here. So they collected slate, split it, and then, and then glued the slate to the sides of the banks of the river to illustrate that there was slate there. So this is, Good literacy, great mathematical uh, understanding developed here, wonderful science. There was also a little hydropower piece that got uh, done as part of this. And then this is what the model looked like towards the end of the um, unit. It still was, actually this is about two thirds of the way through because it got populated with signage and people and cars and other stuff to make it come alive. So again, connecting children with their, the heritage of their place to make them more bonded to, to understand that their place is unique and cool. This is another example of a parish maps project, parish in uh, the south of, uh, near Devon, yeah, on the edge of Devon, I think. Um, and uh, this was a, uh, combined project between a art, local artist and the, tea, and the kids in a classroom who did all the illustrations of the local buildings and the houses. Another project from Vermont um, based on the whole idea of questing. The whole idea of questing emerged from my discovering letterboxing on Dartmoor in the late uh, 1980s and 1990s. Um, and uh, if you don't know anything about uh, letterboxing, you should find out about it. It's a wonder. It's basically an early form of geocaching um, that didn't use technology at all, used to, other than compasses and uh, ordnance survey maps. Uh, but so this, there's a project in the Upper Valley part of New Hampshire and Vermont to create quests, which are essentially in treasure hunts that are made by groups of kids. Uh, classrooms of kids and then put together in a book as a guidebook to exploring local places. So a way to kind of increase ecotourism in your, reg in your, in your region. So kids looking at uh, appropriate panoramic view maps, right? So the whole idea here is that, you know, kids understand panoramic view maps before they understand overhead maps. So using panoramic view maps is appropriate. And then uh, they did some stuff with understand, to understand how to make contour maps. They went out and did um, hide a penny maps on their playground to get into mapping. Then they explored some of the unique places in their community. And then they created this quest map. So this is a treasure hunt to find a a quest box and a quest box is on Dartmoor it was um, uh, often ammunition boxes but here it's more Tupperware containers with a little stamp inside uh, and an ink pad and the stamp represents the place where the treasure is hidden. Uh, so the kids helped to write, kids drew the maps, kids wrote the text 
Um, and then these are all collected together into a, into a book of about a hundred different quest maps. That's what one of the that's the one of the books of Valley Quest in uh, the Upper Valley in New Hampshire and Vermont. I'm going to end with um, a, a sequence of classroom projects from a school in Portland, Oregon. This is the Cottonwood School for Civics and Science. It's a K to eight uh, public charter school. And um, this woman used the, uh, the projects that were in the map making book. She's the, this person is the place-based education coordinator at this school. So she used the map making book and did curric map making curriculum projects with the kids from kindergarten through eighth grade. And so you'll see again, the movement from small in scope, this is a map of the classroom, to out to the whole city. And you'll see a movement from um, not completely consistent, but a movement from three-dimensional model making to more two-dimensional map making. So this is a nice map of a kindergarten classroom. Can you tell how the, I think those are chess pieces to illustrate the, the chairs in the classroom. Here's the, uh, the first and second graders mapping the playground, still with three-dimensional objects, but a slightly bigger area that they have to figure out. Here's the sound map idea. Uh, again, uh, either, I think this was on the playground, but also in their neighborhood, like walking around the block. So again, kids collecting sounds and then uh, assembling them into a map. Here's the fourth and fifth graders making maps of a park that was walkable to, you know, so within uh, you know, a quarter mile of the school and a, and a map that, and a park that they, the kids really liked going to. Here we're starting to spread out fourth and fifth graders also doing um, maps of the original 13 colonies in the United States, um, <clears throat> but three-dimensional. One of the principles in the map making book is that if you're gonna do an area that's large in scope, make it as model, make it as tangible and three-dimensional as possible. So here they're uh, representing the states and they're representing the products of the states. So here's a close-up. So in Virginia, kernels of corn to represent corn as a main product in Virginia and in Pennsylvania out there, those are to represent the mountains in Western Pennsylvania, I think those are Hershey's Kisses because Hershey's is also from Pennsylvania. Here's another, uh, as you get up uh, a little higher into sixth grade, a much more uh, aer pure aerial view map and much more um, mathematically accurate map of the neighborhood where the school is. And then by seventh and eighth grade maps of the whole city <clears throat> with population data on the boroughs. And um, this teacher also is really good at doing good um, uh, social activism kind of curriculum and looking at where the white population and the African-American populations live and the amount of uh, access to parks and trees in, in the white part of the city versus the uh, black part of the city. She, there's a lot of really good social uh, studies education as part of this kind of whole process. And then I'll end with, uh, a nice British Columbia example of all the stuff that we've been talking about. I just, this is, I find this remarkable. I did a, uh, was doing a workshop in, uh, in not in Rossland, but somewhere in, in that part of the world, Nelson or somewhere. And this teacher from Rossland gave me these images of this project she had done with her kid of downtown Rossland. 
So similar to the uh, the Springfield, Mass the Springfield, Vermont uh, project of mapping downtown. And I'm just amazed at the amount of uh, gingerbread that had to be made to go into making that. <laughs> so again, um, if we want if we want to develop a sense of place in kids, then one of these great tools is having kids map what the significant space is for them at different developmental phases in their growth. Um, and I'll end with a quote. My wife was a sixth grade teacher and did a really comprehensive project like this on a local stream going from the, the source of the stream down to where it flowed into the main river, about a 10 mile stretch of river. And they made these beautiful map books of the stream and one of the kids in an evaluation later said, you know, I went from thinking about the Broad Brook as kind of eh, to thinking about the Broad Brook as wow. And that's what we get when you do this, is you move that from like the local place being, well, it's no big deal to a being something that's kind of remarkable. So that's what we're aspiring to. Okay. I'm done, Jade. Thank you so much, David. Um, what an amazing uh, description and adventure through different ways of mapping. I don't know if anyone else is hungry at the end here um, as a result <laughs> of that. And, and I have to ask, so you know that was homemade. They made that gingerbread themselves as opposed to store Yeah, that was home. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was homemade. That's, That's what pretty impressed me. And I've never quite been <laughs> able to figure out what the, what, that, what the snow is in there, whether it's cotton or whether it's Cool Whip or something. <laughs> Yes, yes, or cotton candy or something. How incredible. Uh, thank you for such an amazing adventure. Um, and as someone from England, lovely to see these little, you know, the cul-de-sac concept and looking through a young person's eyes is, is really fantastic. A couple of people posed some questions. Um, Heidi asked uh, right at the beginning when you were showing those sort of series of the same place but different ages she asked are those maps by children drawn without adult instruction oh yeah she's oh yeah okay that's, yeah yeah that's really important yes because uh, Heidi, <clears throat> sorry she just to follow on she said as part of their curriculum in grade one they were taught about bird's eye view but only a few of them or some of them were able to grasp it um she was curious if maybe that was expecting something that isn't necessarily developmentally appropriate yeah, it, yes, she's completely right. It's not developmentally appropriate. Um, and that's and that's what's wrong with lots of social studies or geography curriculum is that it starts out at what's developmentally appropriate for a sixth grader and asks a first grader to do it. Um, and so what we should be doing with first graders is models of places, of models and, uh, and focusing on really small visible areas. Uh, and so all those maps were uh, drawn by individual children. I would take three or four kids at a time, take them into a room, put them at desks so that they couldn't see each, what each other was doing. And then I would give them the same prompt and um, that's what they drew. So there was no instruction in um, how to do it. Or if they asked me, you know, how do I do this? I said, well, you know, you just have to kind of, sh I, I wouldn't give them any assistance. So it's a pretty pure developmental picture of, of, of the progression of map making capacity. And I did it, I did a similar thing on an island in the Caribbean with all Afro Caribbean kids. And the the, uh, the progression is pretty much exactly the same, except uh, you don't get to the pure aerial view map with kids in the Caribbean. And so um, my contention is that the progression from 
the pictorial view up to the high angle perspective view is a biological, is biologically predetermined. And the aerial view, which is the most abstracted kind of mathematical understanding is a, is a learned uh, Western consciousness phenomenon. I think that that's the case. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, Alex asked, um, he said, hello, David. Um, could you please say more about Joseph? So again, this was closer to the beginning. He said something about the Earth matrix versus friends matrix. He didn't quite catch oh, yeah. it. Yeah, this is, this is a guy who was popular more in the late 20th century, a guy named Joseph Chilton Pierce. And he wrote a series of fascinating books, one of them called The Magical Child, and then another one called The Magical Child Matures. And he poses a developmental model um, that is movement through a series of matrices. And the first matrix is the womb. The second matrix is the mother and family. Uh, the third matrix is the earth. The fourth matrix is uh, the, social, the, the social world. Um, and um, so I've focused a lot on the movement from the mother and family matrix into the earth matrix. So you move from the mother and family matrix into the earth matrix at around six or seven. And then you move out of the earth matrix into the social matrix up around 13, 14. And so the maps illustrate this really nicely up until around seven or so kids maps are really house based. And then around eight, seven, eight, they remember I said that the, the world, the significant world became the explorable landscape. Um, and so kids move out in, if, if they have access <clears throat> and it's a safe place, the natural tendency, the biological tendency is to move out into the world and explore the world and to find a, a safe place for yourself in the world. That's what the den is. And so the, the world of dens dominates between seven or 11 and 12. And then it gets left behind because what kids want is to be, you know, a, 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 an adult self in the social world starting around 12 or 13. So that progression of maps kind of parallels what Joseph Chilton Pierce describes in The Magical Child. Uh, that's fascinating to see how that de developmental stages um, can be sort of mm -hmm. visualized. Uh, Jody asked, what were the stamp boxes again? You said there were oh, yeah. a couple of different <clears throat> things. And as being from the UK, I've seen a lot of these too. Did you ever have, Jade, did you ever do letterboxing? In a roundabout way. And then I got very into geocaching when I came to Canada um, yeah. many moons ago. But yes, uh, ammunition boxes. And then you have to sign your name to say you found it or the stamping. Uh, yeah, it's very. Yeah, um, it's a, it's essentially. Yeah, it was essentially the whole uh, questing thing was essentially a non a, a precursor to geocaching. And it just so it didn't use um, compasses or, you know, uh, uh, GPS units. It just used clues and maps to help you, uh, you know, to find your way through a landscape to find a treasure box. And the the box itself was a a uh, Tupperware container. It had a log in it so you could sign in. It had a a rubber stamp that had been carved to represent some unique aspect of the place. It had a stamp pad so you could take the, put the, take the stamp, ink it up, and then collect the image in a book that you kept. So you had a book that you collected stamped images in of all the different places you went, kind of like a passport. And then often in these little boxes as part of it, the educational curriculum was for kids to write up the natural or cultural history of the place that the people, that they had just, the people had just been led through. So it's a, it's a great, it's both a great, uh, it's a great ecotourism thing to do. Um, and there is a, I don't know if there's a letterboxing Canada. There is a letterboxing US 
website, which has a bunch of these. And then there's obviously lots of geocaches and a whole bunch of other variations of this thing. Amazing, thank you. Okay, what we're going to do is we're gonna do one more question, which will take us um, onto the hour and then we'll do our soft close with the prizes and honor people that do have to go right on the hour. And then we'll come in for maybe 10 or 15 minutes of just extra Q and A at the end for anybody that wants to stick around. So thank you so much uh, for all the people that pose questions. They are here, we're gonna try and get to you all at some point. Um, to finish, Linda and then Karuna asked, how would you encourage three and four year olds in their mapping? Oh yeah, that's good. Um, you want to um, you want to give uh, kids the opportunity to basically shape landscapes. So sandboxes are great for this. Um, any kind of uh, small water play is really good for that. And as uh, you know, when I was a teacher of four year olds, we had a great um, we had a really giant block collection. And so you, you want kids to represent space with three-dimensional materials. And uh, Roger Hart, who did a great study called um, Children's Geographies uh, with slightly older kids, asked kids to represent their neighborhood or represent an area by drawing a map of it or by building a map of it with three-dimensional materials. And um, kids were much more able to be accurate in their representation of space with three-dimensional materials rather than with two-dimensional materials. So the big idea is, um, you know, using three-dimensional materials to represent places. At a school in St. Louis, um, one of the uh, one of the uh, activities that uh, four -year the teacher of the four-year-olds does, it's a school that's on a piece. It's about twelve acres, and it's a lot of it's a stream and a lot of brushy woods. And the teacher will wander out into the brushy woods uh, with the four-year-olds, and then say. So you're out of sight of the school and then say to the kids, OK, how do we get back um, so that there's an intentional um, focus on having children start to develop spatial understanding of uh, how places are related and how you navigate in space. And I think that's a great activity. It's really been interesting to watch my two year old granddaughter develop. Uh, she's she's. Her language development is really slow. The development of her spatial understanding of where things are is really sophisticated. So we wanna develop kids' spatial understanding in the real world at, in two, three and four year olds. Amazing, so valuable. I've done some great stuff with sand pits as well. And then getting some of the older kids maybe to draw a physical map that leads yes. to treasure and the yeah. little ones hide the Lego man in there somewhere. And I've had some great success with that. Um, yeah, inspired by, by your work. Okay, everyone, um, we got some prizes coming up. Um, so stay tuned. We are gonna try and answer some more questions as we get going here. Um, but I just wanna share this with you really quickly. Thank you for joining us for this um, map making with children. We've got the 21st of April, we've got looking closely for elementary years. We've got school garden, we've got indigenous perspectives, food cycler learning about reducing food waste and indigenous re resources for educators and learners. So please sign up. Of course, they are all free uh, and we are uh, greatly appreciate your participation and the opportunity to share the important work of so many people with us here. On to the prizes. Okay, we have two $25 gift cards to access elementary learning on the outdoor learning store. You could get one of David's books, particularly the, particularly the map making one. And we've got two tank outside t-shirts up for grabs. Um, because we've been talking about maps, I've got four map trivia questions for you in order to get our winner. Zzz, winners. Uh, so please, um, typing fingers at the ready. It is going to be um, first in best dressed here. So hopefully uh, you are feeling dexterous. Uh, question one, 
who can tell me which century uh, was the first map thought to be created in? Which century? Not seeing it yet. Oh, oh, I think I've got it. Carla Werder, Carla Werder, you are our winner. Um, sixth century, Greek academic uh, Anna Maximander created the first world, world map, they believe, in 6th century BC. So, Carla, congratulations. Fahim's going to take your name, just pop it into our um, document, and then I'll find you later. Okay, question two. There's three more options, three more chances to win. Thank you, for everyone, for participating. Okay, question two. Which Greek philosopher, again, they were quite good at this, uh, was thought to be the first geographer? He... I'm not seeing it. Not seeing it. I'll give you a clue. It's got a silent letter at the beginning. Oh, hello. That did it. Thomas Mooney. Thomas Mooney, you are the second winner of a $25 gift card to the outdoor learning store. We can get some fantastic resources. Uh, yes. Um, Ptolemy, Ptolemy. Sorry, Ptolemy. 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 Thank you, David. I knew you'd have that. Uh, Greek philosopher and academic was regarded as the world's first geographer. Uh, he wasn't, it wasn't his goal, apparently, but it just came about that way. Okay, two Take Me Outside t-shirts, which are ethically made, created, designed in Canada. They are the softest things you'll ever wear and have fantastic messages on the front. Question three. Sorry, do you want to go, Fahim? Or are you happy? Uh, do you have a question for that? I was going to choose them randomly unless you have something prepared. I've got a couple more trivia questions. I'm going to go in. We like trivia. Okay, you. question three. What is the name of the system and the person that invented it uh, in order to project the 3D world onto a 2D rectangle to create a flat map? What's the name of the system or the name to project? Oh. Krista Krotha, Krista Krotha, it, oh, it's actually not quite right, you haven't spelt it right, indeed, sorry, I'm going to have to move on, Andrea Strachan, the Mercator, the Mercator projection, Gerard Mercator wanted to create a map that would assist with global navigation, um, in order to make a 3D sphere fit 2D, he created a projection that shortened um lengthened the latitudes and distorted the poles but uh, it was so popular that by the end of the 18th century it was adopted universally okay so well done there uh, andrea strachan take me outside t-shirt fahim's going to connect with you and we're going to get you something that fits and is delightful last question it's a quick one fingers at the ready please what do the letters this is modern mapping gps stand for what do the letters gps stand for when we're thinking about mapping, oh, that was much easier. Sarah or Sarah Hartley, Global Positioning System, you are correct. You are our fourth and final winner. A take me out, t out take me outside t-shirt is winging its way to you. Um, okay, check your spam. This evening, we will have the follow-up uh, email with you, recording link, certificate, uh, the discount code we're offering any of you participants a fantastic 5% off in the store, in fact, so that you can uh, get involved and there'll be some links to resources and things mentioned in the workshop. Um, so for those of you who do have to go, thank you so much for participating. David, that was a fantastic workshop. Uh, we are, as always, honoured to have your wisdom and knowledge with us here. And um, for those who want to stay around for just a few more minutes, uh, we had a couple more questions that I'll work through uh, just for a few moments here. Thank you, everybody. Lots of thank yous in the chat coming through. So thanks for that. OK, David, Daniela asked, when doing a sound map with kinder kids, would it be too difficult to map the block around your school? Or do you think it would be better to do a smaller sound map of a yard or a classroom instead? Um. I'd probably do the, a smaller scale thing first before doing the block around the school, but um, either one would be fine. There's something nice about the the linear aspect of it. So to go, you know, going from one place to another place. So movement through the landscape um, is uh, 
is an intriguing way to do it. So if I was going to do it on a smaller scale, I might do it um, <clears throat> you know, walking from one part of the playground to a different part of the playground, something like that. Um, we had some, some feelings and challenging moments um, in that. So Lindsay said that the maps of the colonies felt a little painful. She wonders how to explore these mapping techniques without upholding European relationship to the land. Say it um, again. What, Start, say the beginning again. Okay, so Lindsay said the maps of the colonies felt a little painful. Mm -hmm. She wonders how can we explore mapping techniques without upholding European relationship to the land, like what we get from it and what we do to it. And then um, Heather just sort of had another question, but I thought it would be interesting to chat about them both. She says, how many maps teach about indigenous lands and communities, place names derived from indigenous languages, residential school locations, something like that. So yeah, yeah. how do we- uh... There's um, <clears throat> at that same school in Portland, um, there was a third and fourth grade project about uh, uh, native village that was located just north of Portland. And it was, um, and it had, you know, it was flooded out by a dam in the 1950s. So there was a third and fourth grade project about um, learning about the history of that village and uh, the battle of the native peoples against the uh, dam builders. Um, eventually they lost. Uh, and then in the classroom, there was a really large mural map of what the village looked like before it had to be abandoned. And the kids were making uh, three-dimensional models of fish drying racks and cooking techniques and uh, other, uh, you know, other components of indigenous culture, and so it was. Um, I thought. I think. I thought that was a great example of embracing and learning from and learning about the issues of indigenous peoples in a developmentally appropriate way. Um, yeah, that we have an educator here, a local historian who also she's built like a map that's on a sheet and she has moving fish objects and talks about the indigenous history. Um, right. Her name's Lara Stovall, she's a famous author, she wrote a book about the history um, here and yes, yeah, so you can talk about the, the, the cultural and historical change uh, as part of that mapping, be super um, a nice way to present it and engage with some of that and Dana uh, Mulder wrote in here what about if you made a map of gifts instead of a map of resources oh. framing it differently um, Robin Wall Kimmerer discussed the natural resource department at UBC this way last summer and we have um, her book um, um, I want to say gathering sweetgrass, but it's not. It's gathering moss and braiding, braiding, sweetgrass. braiding sweetgrass. I'm reading, I've, or I've just read both back to back and then again and again, it's one of those. Um, but yes, talking about gifts from the land, that could be a really beautiful way. Yeah, thanks, Melanie. <laughs> it's making the, the things together. So yeah, there's some some great options there. Um, here where we have a group has, the Sinites group has got the local names and um, related to, you know, for the Tanaha, where I live, is the land of the Miskakis, which is the Chickadee, and they call the Columbia River the Chickadee River, and so you can do a whole mapping thing about related to the animals here, so lots of options. Um, Karuna asks, can you share a little bit more about how aerial view is a learned Western consciousness? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a hypothesis of mine, which I can't... <laughs> Uh, it just, and it occurred to me because I worked with lots of kids on this island in the Caribbean and even uh, 15 and 16 year olds uh, didn't ever draw aerial view maps. Now, a lot of it had to do with the fact that they weren't, is that that kind of map wasn't really available to them as a model and they never got taught it. But, um, but they did do all the other stuff. They went through all those other stages of development of the maps moving 
outwards in terms of scope and upwards in terms of perspective, but it never got to the aerial view. So I, so that's the basis of my contention that there's a developmental disposition towards the, the movement upwards, but the last step I think has to be, is not, um, is not biologically inherent, but it has to be taught. So that doesn't mean that mm -hmm. those kids couldn't have, couldn't have learned to do aerial view maps. It's just that they, they weren't taught them and there weren't any examples for them in their uh, local culture. Yeah, and I guess having the technology to actually hover yeah. above the land and get that yeah. is a really interesting so it, concept. No, it's really interesting to realize that none of these, all these kids that draw these, per, these high angle perspective views, they've never seen those. Right. Those are all con those are, all those images are constructed out of a cognitive capacity to imagine to imagine what it looks like from above. Right. Very deep, very thoughtful. Yeah. Uh, Lynn asked if children do not have the ability to create a natural den, how could that impact on their development? Yeah. You know, I one of the things that I will I've always thought of doing and never have done was to look at the relationship between uh, children's den making or fort making or whatever special place making and uh, their environmental uh, ethics as adults. Because I think there's a correlation between the bonding with the earth that happens from special place construction and being a, having environmental ethics. And so if, um, so since I think it's a deep biological drive, it's something we want to provide for kids. And if they can't do it in their own neighborhoods, then we want to be able to take them to places where they can do it and you know, read them, you know, read them literature that shows kids doing it and then uh, having them be in a place and having and maybe having to uh, you know, model it with kids to show that it's okay. Um, if it, you know, it happens indoors in lots of ways as well. And so the desire for privacy in your own space, you can, can, you can allow it or encourage it indoors um, as well. And in urban and in cities, you know, alleyways and, uh, and uh, abandoned buildings and, uh, the space in between the backyard and the fence, which is only three yards wide, um, uh, kids will find the secret or the special place even in a non-natural setting. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Melissa asked, somebody talked about distance. Uh, she was wondering how children measure distance and scale when mapping. She works with four to 12 year olds and was maybe looking for some ideas. Well. Uh, uh, a great thing to do is to, um, uh, you know, obviously to have kids understand what a foot is by using their feet to measure stuff. And then it's really an, another good, and this is in the map making book, there's, um, it's good to have kids understand what, their, what the length of their stride is, you know, two steps. And then, um, and then if you're going to measure like the size of a field, uh, having kids um, know what the length of their stride is and then you know, counting the number of strides it is and then translating that into the number of feet that it is. So you wanna start with things that are, uh, are part of kids' physiognomy, right? They're uh, you know, learning the, the length of the foot. I always, um, I always teach kids to understand this, the distance from their thumb to their pinky to learn that as a standard unit of measure. So if you know, I know that it's nine inches, so I can, whenever I have to measure stuff, I can use that as a measure. So as much as possible, embedding measurement in kids' bodies in the beginning is a great way for them to naturalistically understand uh, measurement and distance. Fantastic. There's also that great project where you 
this is also from the map making book where you you uh, figure out you <clears throat> measure the distance from the school to a mile away and um, then you uh, scale the solar system into that mile and then you locate the planets along along that mile in the right scale um, and that's a that's a that's for older kids. That's a really great way to start to understand big measurements. Excellent. Yeah, scale, temporal, and things. It's really, really a complex um, abstract idea. Okay, we've got. To, I've got one last question for you um, before we're going to close up here. So thank you so much for everyone for participating and, and delving so deep into this. Um, but Stephanie says, do you have any recommendations for other resources like historical biographies to get to know an area better? They've just relocated, I guess, generally, as opposed to very specific place based ones. Or anything maybe that has inspired you and then can work from that. I'm trying to figure out what this person's asking. Say it again. Do you have recommendations for other resources such as historical biographies uh, to get to know an area better? So they've just relocated. Uh, Emma's yeah. saying in the thing, my map book by Sarah Finelli. Yeah, so in terms of um, good, so in not to plug the map making book, the map making good <laughs> book has a really good bibliography in it. And it has a good bibliography of, of map making curriculum books, but it also has a good bibliography of children's books that um, involve maps and uh, children's books that ought to have maps. And so it's, it's a fun activity. I don't know whether this is relevant to what this person's asking. It's a fun activity to take a children's book that doesn't have a map with it, but lays itself out geographically and have it as a classroom project to make or construct a map together or for kids to make maps of the, the landscape in the book. In terms of books that uh, are good to stimulate knowing the place, uh, there's uh, the book called Caddy Woodlawn which is, I'm not sure it's kind of peace, it's politically correct in terms of relationships with indigenous peoples anymore. Um, but it's a great story of a young girl of moving to a new place and then learning that place. Um, yeah, I think that's what, okay. I think that's good. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, so I will uh, honor everyone's time and screen time and it's a little later out east for you, David, um, yeah. some of us, although I see, uh, I think, is it you, Benjamin, you're in Europe having a, a little nap or almost uh, ready to drift off there, the dulcet tones of David Sobel. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and to the 300 people and the however many we've still got, well over 100 who uh, stuck around for the Q&A. Uh, we're so grateful for your participation. Join us for more workshops and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Jade. Thank you, David. Thanks, David. And thank you everyone for joining.